everybody. It's me, Ashley. Welcome to Archetype, sponsored by Lumpo, also brought to you by Noman. Um, yes, we're here. Episode four, I believe, of this group character that we're creating. Last week, we had like a really chill uh, sculpting some cloth sessions. So now we're going to get into probably finalizing um, his bracer and finalizing some more stuff onto his uh, gauntlet and arm. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see if go, where it goes. I have some ideas of maybe what I want to do, but a lot of it's going to be kind of figuring out and discovering along the way um, as we walk out this guy. But I'm going to go ahead and start with this other gauntlet bracer first. Um, sometimes I like to tackle something that I have a better idea of first um, before jumping into a part that I'm like, mm, I have a lot of things that I could do with it, but I'm not really sure what I want from it yet. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start making, you know, this leather gauntlet um, to start with. And it would help if I did not have such terrible topology. There we go. One way that there's just nice loops that go all the way around. You don't want spiraling or you know, anything like that. Um, as you kind of like hard surface this stuff out. Because even, you know, even though it's not going to be hard surface, even though it's going to be, you know, a little bracer or gauntlet or something like that, um, you kind of have to treat it like as if it's going to be hard surface. Um, just so that way you get it nice and clean. Kind of like the way we tackled the cloth before. I'm going to go ahead and polish by features, which is a super handy tool. Polish by features um, is also in the deformation tab. I have it in my little custom UI and it helps a lot. Uh, just because it will straighten things out, but also polish by features will base it on polygroup. So if you have polygroup saved, it'll polish things out based on polygroups as well, which is always really handy, um, especially for hard surfacing, which, you know, later on today, I'll probably do some of that when we're sculpting our I'm just kind of evening out what the thickness is up here. I'm going to add some, I think it would be kind of like maybe little cutoffs or something like that, or a little bit of trim or maybe like a thicker edge. Um, this is my reference also that I'm looking at, which is if you draw on this little thing. I really like the, I don't really know what this is, but I like it. I like this little t-shirt, this little like weird quilted thing with this quilted leather and these little studs. So I'm going to try to do just my own kind of like version of that, um, and see where that goes and see where that brings me. So yeah, I'm just going to make sure that. I want these to be and feel like pretty even. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect the way I approach it. I want to be kind of technical, um, but I want to make sure that, you know, it's kind of organic. I'll probably split these off. So I like to start by building out um, one shape and then I'll split it or duplicate it and like build on top of that, um, depending on, you know, what I'm doing. Just helps uh, create more consistency and, and allow for me to make sure that all the parts kind of go together easier so that they fit nicely on top of one another. You know, if I create one, then I could probably just duplicate that one down and bring it down um, later. But it's always nice to have just like the placeholder for now. But I'll probably just try to make one and see how I do with that, and then um, go from there. So 
just going to straighten this out. I always hit Alt to make sure that all the polygroups um, can be different, because if you don't, it'll keep it with the same polygroups that you extruded last, and that can get kind of confusing. Um, so yeah, now it's like, that kind of looks like that. And if we, even if we use uh, polish white features on this, you'll see that it'll kind of sharpen it up. It'll always kind of concave stuff, so if you don't want it to do that, um, you can always get rid of the edge loop for now if you don't need it. And then when you, you know, polish white features, it'll stay that way. Or you can always um, scale it up later and kind of fix that a little bit. Yeah, I'm just going to adjust this stuff to feel a bit more even. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Leather is, you know, valuable. Um, even with my hard surface and stuff, you know, for something like this, because also keep in mind that I'm doing this kind of quickly for you guys, because it's, you know, only so many episodes that I can work on these characters. I'm going to go ahead and see what happens when I kind of extrude every other one of these. Hopefully it's even. If I did it correctly, hopefully it'll be. We'll see. Um, no, it's not. That's okay. Actually, I'll leave it like that. Um, and then maybe we can add like a little buckle or something there, so that should make sense. But, you know, on the inside it wouldn't be super, super even. Or we could split it off later and I'll show you how to do that. Yeah, that play around this is what may or may not work. I'm thinking for these little studs, um, you know, may, it might be enough to have um, just that and then we can actually insert like little studs that go around the bracer um, and insert like a little belt. So it's really easy to add things like that. We could go in here make this a checker. You can do polygroup and then you can say checker. Um, maybe some of you guys were wondering what the heck this is for. But it does checker your model and that makes it really easy to be able to go in and say, okay, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and insert a sphere and then I'm going to go ahead and go to my I think it's this one has, yeah, it has a little half sphere. But I want to make it pretty low poly. And then I can say I can create a nano mesh out of that. And then I can go back up here. And I can just make sure that nano mesh is on the of the ball. And I can drag that out. Oh, looks like it didn't save. Oh, it changed it for some reason. There we go. For some reason, it saved a single poly instead of just drawing out the stud like I wanted. Um, but yeah, you can see you can get nice, really even studs. And they don't technically exist yet. They're technically um, in nano mesh. And within nano mesh, you could adjust the size of these um, and whatnot. And again, if you know, you know, if this was uneven polygon, which it is, I can always change that beforehand. So if we are going to do something like that, um, I can just make sure we can insert or delete one. So I can delete that edge loop and slide that over. There is an equalize, but I don't I don't think that's necessary. Because you can also do polish by features and that should kind of start to even out some of this quality a little bit. But yeah, now with that we could um, drag out with that nano mesh, go back to the mesh brush. Gotta find my thing again. There it is. I keep going back to it. Get over here. I don't know why it's being here today. Great much.
There you go. What I like about keeping it in there, Mitch, too, is if you need to move this stuff around, um, you can say I can move it, it won't warp um, the nano mesh. So, you know, keeping it like that to begin with is kind of nice um, when you're starting, just so that way you can create like a nice thing to that. You know, the screws technically won't, you know, they won't deform or, you know, things that are made of metal won't deform. So making sure that your stuff can stay that way, uh, it's really handy. I'm gonna go ahead and I can go ahead and I guess I'll crease that later. For now it's fine. I wanted to crease a little bit, but I don't want to get rid of my nano mesh. So if I wanted to, I could take this guy now and I could duplicate it. Now you can kind of adjust the overlaps and things like that on it. I can hide that original uh, base mesh to see what I get. You know, maybe it's something that follows along, all the way along the outlet. So instead of maybe them being together, maybe these little studs can kind of sit like a little farther apart. Now I can bring this one back up a little bit. So I can do that one or two ways, but I think I'm just going to go ahead and just extrude the edge. Just like this. Yeah, I mean, looking at reference is super important for things like this, um, just so it gives you some ideas and also kind of gives you some sort of plan. Um, cause it, I will tell you right now, because sometimes with certain things for this character, like I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it, it makes it hard to figure out and block out those shapes in 3D. I always find it a lot easier to try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, you know, outside of 3D. Because 3D can just be a little bit more um, of a pain to kind of like move back and forth and things. So I try my best to make sure that I try my best to make sure that I have kind of what I want mapped out before jumping into 3D. 3D is a great way to, you know, push and pull some shapes. But when it comes to doing, you know, getting all these details and mapping out, you know, what you want. That's obviously going to be a little more uh, difficult. So I'm going to go ahead and... I already have actually kind of like a quilted pileable texture that I can put um, on top of this. So I'll probably just do that and have it... Um, Let's just see what that looks like because I can always preview it before uh, I do anything super, super crazy. But I'm going to go ahead and extrude that in. And let me see if I can find that little tileable texture of mine is. On my super secret screen that you can't see. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> if you guys don't know how to make tile and textures, you guys definitely should check out um, Michael Pavlovich, I think, on YouTube has a good tutorial with it. Um, but you could also just look up, you know, making tileable textures in in Photoshop or in ZBrush, and it's super, super handy because if you can't quite find like the texture that you want, um, it's really easy to go in there and make it tileable, um, texture yourself, and then to be able to utilize that. So I'm going to go ahead and add some poly groups. So um, the best way to do this is to make sure that it's UV properly. So go UV master, and I'll say work on clone, and I'll do it by poly groups, flatten it. And now I just want to make sure that um, the quilting pattern is going to run the correct way. And I think actually with it being at kind of like these 45 degree angles, um, I think it's actually already fine. So we'll go ahead and copy it. Um, if it's not, we can adjust it later and then fine. I'm going to piece that. The um, reason why you want, you know, you can project um, surface noise without having UVs, but if you're doing, you know, something like fabric, uh, you need something that's going to actually be flattened out because at the beginning of um, doing surface noise, it's just going to project from one angle. So you want to make sure that it's based on UV. So that way it projects on the UVs instead from one angle instead of on the object from one angle, and then you can get a full nice um, Turn up the strength here. Turn off that noise. And also, by default, it will always do this um, colorizing thing, which is definitely annoying. There we go. So I can scale this to whatever I want it to be. And that's looking all right. I can turn off relative um, if I can't push the scale up to what I want it to be. It's always going to preview you a little weird. You know, it's going to have these like mental artifacting, um, but that's okay. Just because it it's just like a weird visual um, artifact because it's trying to, to compensate what that texture is going to look like um, with like really low polygons. So it's just like this weird preview error. But don't worry about it and don't you know worry about it too much. Looking at um, the character is going in kind of a weird direction, so we're going to go back into our, um, let's say, work on clone. And we're going to flatten this. Um, you can see that where the direction of the UVs are going, so I'm going to go ahead and select that. I'm going to ro rotate it 90, and it doesn't matter if it overlaps because one's just the inside and one's the outside. I'll make sure that they're kind of facing the right direction, or at least facing upright. And now that we have that, I can unflatten that and say copy. And then it can go back to my tool and say paste. And you'll see that it corrects. Um, so now we have the kind of armor sculpting uh, or texture going down the right way. Then for this glove, uh, I actually want to kind of create, you know, um, kind of like a big overlap. So I don't have to actually worry about where the leather brace is going to go, and I can kind of soften this and I can make it bigger. There we go. I can take my move brush and I can move this out start kind of adjusting the glove. It's going to sit on top of that. I'm grabbing the character, not my, there we go. You 
see some, um, you know, weird overlaps or whatever it may be. Some of it's the previewing of, again, the you know, surface noise that we have. So for now, you don't have to worry about it too much. Again, this might be too much detail to put. See how, you know, maybe just one at the top would look good, and then maybe uh, we can put some studded trim like on the gloves instead. So, again, keeping with consistency of, you know, the kind of texture that I want. Um, wow. You know, keeping with the. Uh, the reference that I was using. And I actually do think, I'm kind of curious, I have, um, let's see. Yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, so the one that I had before, um, it had like weird studying on it that I actually don't want on the, uh, on the actual leather itself. I just want, Just fabric. I'm going to go ahead and insert actually here. I'm going to try to find where I want that trim go. Extrude this all in. A lot of this stuff will look, it's interesting because the process for all this stuff, um, everything will look like pretty low poly for a while or it won't feel super, super finished or refined. Um, and then once you start adding like these tiny little details, we can get into it. Um, that'll actually start to make, you know, a really big difference. I can mask uh, the inside if I want like a thicker lip. I can mask the inside and I can pull all this stuff in. Because I don't mind the thinness of it, um, you know, up he over here where the fingers come out of, but I want the lip of it to be a lot thicker. So I'm gonna make sure I thicken all that stuff up. There we go. So yeah, this will kind of look low poly. It'll kind of just be like, until you're ready to start, you know, texturing and stuff or detailing and stuff, it'll usually kind of stay pretty low poly. I think I want to put in maybe, um, it's got some like metal studs on the, uh, on the knuckles here. So I can go ahead and grab that same poly here. I can go ahead and drag these out. They should be just separate poly groups, so I can select these, select that one, and I can split them off. And then I can position them um, a little better if I need to. Again, sometimes with this stuff, if I make the move brush really, really big, and I just do like a move topological, if I make it really big, it shouldn't warp the, uh, the studs if you're just moving it just a little bit, just to kind of put them in the right place. Um, I think it'd be cool if there's maybe some sort of like overlap with the fingers and where the uh, studs were. So I'm just gonna bring this up a little bit. I think to make things look complex and feel complex, you kind of want a lot of overlap and you know different shapes of like big, medium, small. Um, so I'm gonna duplicate this. I'm just gonna grab the this part. Okay. I actually just kind of want to see if I can grab as many edge loops as I can. They're easy to grab. We'll see. But I kind of just want this section here. I'll invert that. 
I'm gonna try on double so I can see what I'm grabbing. Yeah, I don't want that. And I don't really care about the fat either. So then now I can all do this. So I kind of just want, you know, something like that. And I will tweak them. So now I have, I love to build on top of what I already have. And you can see that, you know, now I can, now I know where that is, I can probably move that stuff up a little bit. Now I can extrude this out. Right, start getting some extra shapes on there. Even just kind of feeling like that is, is helpful to see, you know, what other kind of um, breakup. And I know I'll probably give some trim. I'm going to give a thick, you know, seam line around and start sculpting some stuff. But I think maybe putting in um, some sort of like buckle or something can be helpful. Um, I still have some stuff, but I don't want what's left. I can't fill in those yet with color um, until I make them no longer a, a narrow mesh, but for now I'm just going to wait and see if I can like what I like on there. Uh, question from Twitch. Did you ever study armor to learn stuff like this or do you just research based on the stuff you're doing? Um, I mean, I feel like naturally when you, you know, work in the industry, you're going to be working on tons of varieties of things. So in practical effects, I did build a lot of armor um, because it was normally something that had to go on people and that's just really common. So <laughs> uh, yeah, you end up having to study a lot of like armor and how, you know, it fits on the things and what works and what doesn't work. But at the same time, you know, you can't stick super truly to your reference because then you're not really creating a stylized thing either. So it's kind of about this fine balance that you can have um, between the two and see if you can, you know, kind of find a happy medium between like interesting shape design, 2D abstract shape design, along with, you know, functionality of something. So that's just going to give a stylized look. It's going to make it feel stylized, but it's also going to make it feel, you know, realistic. Um, which I think is usually the goal. So yeah, and that also, I mean, studying different armor from many different cultures and stuff as well is super important too. Um, because everywhere you go, you know, armor is going to look different. You know, most samurai, there's, it's funny because, you know, if you look up samurai armor, you'll find really cool varieties of um, you know, really complex samurai and it's stitched together and does all these wonderful things. But then also, sometimes they just wear like a kimono type thing. Um, so you can get like very complex to like super simple in within just even one culture. So I think, you know, exploring as much as you can is really important to see what's going to work well with, uh, you know, what you're building. So I'm building out the trim. What I can do now too with that is um, I'll probably take with this I, I want to keep maybe I'll increase. I'm thinking about where I want to crease it right now so I'm going to crease it at a level of like maybe two see if I get something a little bit sharper and then I can choose when I smooth it out or not. So yeah, so you usually will get to a point kind of like this where you're like, now's the time to commit and like start sculpting onto it or, you know, time to make changes. Um, and again, like I can always duplicate this and have a low poly one later if I, for some reason, mess up the one that I'm working on. But yeah, I can go ahead and start, maybe crease level two is even a little too much, but let's do crease level one maybe. I'm gonna leave it Let's do two. So I'll do two and then uh, I'm gonna subdivide this and let that smooth out. 
And this is again where you can do it. And all of last week was basically going in sculpting um, a bunch of fun, you know, leather detail and stuff. Or you'd be getting, you know, pinching. Or you would you be getting, you know, stuff. If this is like, for example, stitched on, um, maybe you're getting cool little stitch, you know, tension points in places like this. And usually, usually less is more. Um, I think I mentioned in the last stream that Sometimes I will kind of go and like over sculpt, um, but most of the time I'll end up going back and you know, like, ah, oh, I don't really need this much detail in this area. Um, and I can always, you know, go back and adjust that and fix that later. But yeah, usually a good rule of thumb, especially for stylized stuff, will be, you know, less is more. But that, that also really depends on, you know, what you're sculpting for. You know, if you're sculpting for a isometric top-down, like MOBA type game, then obviously the details that you put in are going to be different um, than doing like a first-person shooter. Most of the time first-person shooters, we don't even model the back of the gun if you don't see it. Um, you know, we'll call it out so it doesn't even exist. And we don't focus a lot on, you know, what that detail is going to be in the back because you'll never see that detail. Um, so it's stuff like that that I think is important to keep in mind like what are you sculpting for and like what is the purpose and like a little bit of trim around that We could do something where, again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it's kind of, I feel like sometimes that is, it'll look a little more organic if you kind of let some imperfection show through. Um, Cause I just don't like hard to this model, you know. Um, they mentioned, not that this is a reason of like, to do things sloppy. It's not about doing something sloppy per se. Um, I would go in and clean this up a little bit more, but the biggest thing is also just to jot, basically like jotting down the idea that you have as well. And looking back from a distance, be like, okay, does, you know, in setting these studs, does that feel good or does that feel right? You know, um, is that working? Is that not working? So while I do this stuff, I'm also constantly asking myself questions as to whether or not, you know, is this working? Does this feel good? Um, you know, now that I inset them in, you know, thickened it, they feel, a little too inset, so I can just grab them, I can pull these out a bit more. Um, but what I was going to say that, you know, about sculpting and perfection stuff, uh, if you watch the documentary for Arcane, they actually talk about how there are no perfect circles um, in the entire show. So everything is just hand done and it's supposed to feel, you know, um, super organic. The only thing that actually is like a perfect circle is the uh, the hex tech ball that Jace creates. Um, it's fun to work, I guess, if you don't see it, but you guys should watch it. Um, and so yeah, you know, so that says a lot about story-wise what they're thinking about, you know, with their characters and things. So, you know, being intentional with whether you choose for something to be imperfect or not um, is really important like how that character is going to feel. Um, you know, and I want it to feel maybe a little, maybe it can feel a little stitched together, um, partially because, you know, we're doing a medieval, but we're also doing kind of something that's um, steampunky as well. So we want to think about, you know, maybe he makes his own armor or maybe he, you know, has to stitch a bunch of this stuff together because he broke some of it or whatever it may be. Um, you know, you want that to be able to read properly. So now I can take this and I can add a 
I'm gonna be trimming. Probably don't want to add it in the long bean. A uh, question from YouTube. Uh, now I'm going to upload this series in the channel. It is, I believe. I think it's all up to date. I don't know, actually. But I'm pretty sure you can find all the episodes that I've done along with the other episodes of the previous um, streamers have done, or hosts, whatever you would like to call us, um, have done. So yeah, you should be able to find that. On the architect on YouTube, on the architect videos. So if you found it, you're like, man, I really want to block out this, you know, chipmunk character. It should be there. You can go check it out. You can also go check out the um, last character, which was the trickster, which we're playing off of um, this character with as well. So yeah, make sure that you tune in for that stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and mask that now. Now I can actually sculpt a crossing if I want to. I'm going to increase the intensity a bit more and sculpt some like smaller forms without worrying about it messing up my uh, seam line. wanted to I can also finish this a bit more just so it feels a little more even. And I the topology really shouldn't be getting too messed up with from that. Nothing too crazy. I'm not too worried about it. Um in a real pipeline setting, yeah you probably want to make sure that all that stuff is nice and even um before subdividing. For example, you can see that this actually has way more detail on the bottom than it does on this top smaller part because there was only there were no edge loops. So technically, if you're going to do it right, uh, you want to make sure that there's even edge loops across here and here as well. So that way, when you do subdivide it, you have even it subdivides into an even topology. So that way, your resolution of your model stays the same. Because you can see that um, while this looks okay in detail, see how pixelated this is. So in order to get this up to the proper detail. I'll have to keep subdividing this more and more to make it look good. And then all this detail just gets too much. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And um, just keep that in mind like when you're making stuff. Again, because it's kind of untreated, it's like a high res maquette. Um, nothing too fancy is happening with this. Uh, I don't I don't really mind. It's all about trying to get as much as I can done. Um, within the stream, so that way you guys can just at least see the process. But I'll make a note of that. That usually that's what I would do um, if I was paying attention. Now we've got this kind of like big braids or type thing going on, um, and I could actually probably make. I don't know, maybe I could put these two together and make them a little thicker. Make it feel like it's a really puffy filtered out. I'll go back in and change, you know, and adjust colors and stuff. Um, I can go ahead and probably submit to this nano mesh. Because again, also, um, if I wanted to, I could like make a copy of it or duplicate and keep it. This is not that complicated where it would be too hard just to do it again. So I'll just say when a mesh, um, and now it's a mesh. And then I can go ahead and take my little studs and I'll just split them away. I can split them. And then now I can go in and group by my normals and increase it with a to one. And I'll just make sure that these have the same color as this. And there we go.
And if I wanted to now, what I can do is I can see what I have um, just really quickly. I can go into my brushes. I think I did this on the last character too. Um, go into my third thing. And I have some, yeah, I think in costume. I have some belts and straps and things. Let's see. Oops, I can click on stitches and I want that. I don't want stitches. I want these buckles and straps. So yeah, I have some of these buckles and straps. Um, so I can easily probably take, you know, something like this, for example. Um, and I can just drag that out. I'll drag it out on something else that doesn't have the surface noise texture, just so it's easier to see. There we go. I can drag out something like that, and then I can you know, maybe create like a little loop. I'm gonna turn off uh, curves mode for this. Oh my goodness, my hands. So I can drag this out. Put this in there. And I'll just keep in mind of where I'm putting, you know, a seam or whether it would be, you know, maybe some sort of stitching or something like that. Um, or it would be one on one side and then I would make, you know, a little bit of a buckler. Somewhere over here. And again, this doesn't have to be accurate, accurate yet. I just want to put in like a placeholder of like, yeah, this is like a strap thing. It goes over there. It kind of looks like that. Um, oh, I actually think it would be, it'd be reversed. Oops. Something like that, and then I'm like, yeah, then there would be another, you know, some sort of other strap, like... We just want to turn on curve mode for that one. Yeah, that got, you know, this gets stitched on or studded into whatever, and then we have their strap, and then there'll be some sort of form of break and the same thing. So, again, just trying to, like, put together the pieces. Um, I've always actually meant to take these brushes that I have and make them a little easier to where I can drag it out and has uh, all that stuff with ease onto it. But, see, now I can have that, and it's right now attached to our, um, you know, gauntlet thing, but that's okay, it's easy enough to get rid of. I can either do that, and I can say Control shift um, s which will shrink it. So it'll shrink everything that I uh, kind of partially got selected, and then I'll just go ahead and say Scroll. Hidden. Cool. And I can split these off eventually later too, but for now I'll just, uh, I'm going to fill the colored ones, I'm going to go ahead and select I'll be like an auto group, so that way I can just select what's the buckle and then what's, you know, studs. So these are the things that are going to be, because I just want to colorize it. So that way I can get a feeling of, you know, how that looks and feels. Um, and now if I wanted to, you could easily take this and be like, if you want to add more complexity, you can just drag this down. Um, and now you have something that's far more complex and interesting. Um, You can kind of work into you know shape and once we sculpt on top of the clothed stuff we can kind of make sense of where all this goes but again my biggest thing is just to kind of like get it in there and see how it feels um first and see if that's something that you like or don't like or whatever it may be and then from there you can build out um you know fix your figure and all that stuff out sin happy tuesday how goes it my my main it's my main buddy Tonton said they're always here I always appreciate it oh um, it's going good we kind of pulled out this little bracer here I'm missing it out but now we're gonna start on doing probably some of the hard surface and stuff um, but yeah I just want to kind of finalize some more pieces and again thinking about how I finished this guy is something where 
you know, maybe I want to make sure that, you know, maybe these studs should be the same color as the stuff that we have here. Because I also, you know, eventually I'm not exactly sure um, what color our other stuff is. For now, look, it's silver because we're going with that medieval armor vibe, but it's going to have the aesthetic of, um, you know, steampunk. But yeah, looking at the way, you know, you finalize one thing and making sure that across the board you're going to finalize all the other stuff that same way. So, you know, with something like this. Um, thank you, Sam. He says, good job. I appreciate it. We all need a little pile in the back. We all need some love. So yeah, that's when I subdivide this. I can treat this the same way I treat in, you know, um, this type of trim, right? Um, just for consistency's sake. You know, and maybe these are also, again, studded in so I can kind of pop these out. Chill pop music that we got going on. It's just just up enough for me to want to um, work quickly, <laughs> but not chill enough for me to just be like, oh, I'm just gonna relax and do whatever. I think last time I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna smoke some pot for two hours. Um, but now today we're gonna try to make some good progress. Um, but yeah, you can do some things like that. And just make sure that the, the texturing kind of feels similar-ish. And again, a lot of this stuff is like, just get, just get the feeling of it in there first before trying to worry so much about like, oh, it doesn't feel right yet, or it doesn't, you know, it's really messy or whatever it may be. That's all okay for now. Um, again, just getting it in there and seeing like, overall, does it feel good? If the answer is yes, then cool. And like move on to the next thing until you get all of it feeling good and at like, um, a good place, you know, so. So we're going to start doing some hard surfacing stuff. Oh boy, <laughs> not that you Just kidding, I do like it, it's cool. Um, no, so one of my ideas for this is we're going to try to make, you know, something that has steampunk vibes. Um, while staying within um, the realm of medieval, right? So I want to add some elements that feel steampunky, and I want to add some stuff that will feel like it's, you know, um, got lots of pipes or, you know, interesting kind of tertiary details that don't fit, feel medieval, but on that basic silhouette, it should kind of look, um, you should feel kind of medieval or you should look somewhat medieval. And then it's not until you actually look at the details, you're like, oh man, there's actually more to this. Um, and there's gonna be, you know, all those extra ones and stuff. So that's what we're gonna try to do. That's gonna be our goal. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I'm just going to start out really basic and just try to see if I can find some shapes that I like or something that I think would be interesting. So I think like a cool little like deep diving suits or, you know, they have like these cool little like, there's a lot of very, there's a lot of circular kind of like grill patterns and things like that on, um, you know, steampunkish characters and whatnot. So we're going to see, you know, if I can get something feeling interesting. I think the big secret for all this stuff will be making sure that my devils feel, um, if ZBrush will let me devil this. Sometimes it's just easier to insect. There we go. And then I can move this up. So I'll be constantly creasing and moving stuff um, to get kind of like a baseline feel. 
And then I think it'd be cool if there was some, there's a lot of stuff, but again, like we want to put like that leather and studding on top of um, things. So I'll probably just take, I'm going to take this. And, and so when I start detailing stuff like this, it's not about adding crazy amount of detail to hard surface first. It's about getting in all the shapes that you need um, and then start working from there. So, you know, I'm going to block in everything that I can first, like very low poly and make sure that all these shapes feel like they're going well together first. Um, before, you know, jumping into anything super, super finalized, I think is really important um, to begin with. I think I want this, I split this off before, thinking that maybe it could be like a weird separate extra piece that's like attached onto something else. So maybe, maybe that's true. So maybe I'll have it float and maybe it'll get attached through like some um, metal clipping or something like that. There's a lot of weird like wiring and stuff like that that can, you know, um, or some weird like hinges or type joints that can fit onto that. Um, so if I have that idea, then, you know, what I'll do is... It sounds always like a lot of work, but every time I tell myself, I'm like, these shapes are not hard. Um, most shapes that you're going to be creating for this stuff isn't hard, it's just a lot of shapes. That's kind of what's so intimidating usually about creating. Um, you know, something that's hard surfacey and it's something that feels or looks really complicated is it it looks really complicated but when you break it down into its simplest forms um usually it'll actually not be as complicated as it looks um so just keep that stuff in mind i'm modeling this in a very weird way but that's just don't mind me I want to create like a little that by normals. I get something that looks like that. I'll do something like that and then I'll say, you know, uh, well first I want to probably make sure that it's beveled properly the way I want it to um, because I'm going to use it as a insert mesh. So when you create insert meshes, you, you just want to make sure that, you know, you're you are creating the oh that's what it's doing my bad i was like why give me give me the things i want the things why does this not want to pause it it's been so long. oh is it checkering i'm so done it's checkering guys help me <laughs> it's like, why is it giving me different colors? No. Okay, there we go. Sorry, Mom. Yeah, uh, Synth mentioned uh, in the Twitch chat that, you know, something like Transformers is really complicated. And that is really complicated, for sure. Um, but it's also one of those things that you want to think about one piece at a time, you know? Uh, if you look at it as a whole, you're just like, man, that's a, that's a lot. And you're right. Um, but as you break it down, you know, you realize you're like, oh man, that's like just a lot of cylinders or it's a lot of, you know, something else very, very specific. And, you're, and then you can start kind of, you know, making something digestible is really important. Um, just to make sure that that process, you know, um, doesn't feel like too unachievable. It's kind of the goal. Some sort of like bent metal type thing we've got going on here. I'm going to bring this up because it doesn't need to be probably that thick. But I know it's, you know, a lot of this stuff is adjustable later. Um, yeah, create something like that. Say create the insert mesh. 
and say you. Now if I go up to this guy, I can just drag him out. And I'm looking at something like Iron Man, always seems like really intimidating at first. Um, but again, just, just making sure that you're breaking down and stuff properly. Into bite sized pieces is what's gonna help you a lot. So we'll create something like that. Maybe we'll have ones at the very edges. So this big clamp thing is, you know, it's actually kind of like welded or nut bolted on, you know, kind of vibe. Um, again, making it feel kind of homemade-ish. Not that it has to be homemade, but it should feel kind of interesting like that. What is that hole? What is this? What are you? Oh, I accidentally dragged on something else. Let's get rid of that. Uh, there's a question from YouTube. How do I make the intersection of muscles clean? I'm always giving a vision example like the hair or the biceps. Um, so I'm assuming you mean about such a, something like muscle overlaps. You know, so if we're looking at something like this, for one thing, one of the reasons why I do model the way I model or sculpt the way I sculpt is like this deltoid is a completely separate object. So if I wanted this line to be super harsh it kind of can be um and then i can just kind of like lightly blend on top of it um with the clay build up brush but the other thing too is um you know get clean intersections for like muscles and stuff do not be afraid to like get in there and like really carve deep into um where those intersections are you know there's i'm really trying to make sure that i know where that bicep intersects into, you know, the next muscle or this radial, radial brachialis muscle um, inserts. Like, don't be afraid to carve. I think a lot of beginner sculptors um, aren't digging deep enough into their stuff. Um, I think it's really important. Yeah, as you can see, if you, even if you just carve in a little bit more than maybe what you think is comfortable, it'll look a lot cleaner. Um, it'll be more clear to like your audience, especially for stylized stuff. You can get really intense with that stuff. So, for example, you can, you know, you can even treat it almost like a hard surface piece. Like you create kind of like a, a really thick beveled edge on top of that. So that's an example of something like that. Someone's sitting on the keyboard, what's happening on YouTube? Too many weird comments going on. Uh, YouTube says I'm a beginner sculptor myself, I'm the head and all the other body parts separate. Yeah, that stuff I think is super, super else, uh, useful. But again, the head is always going to be in separate from the body most times because you'll be detailing it. It's actually hard to tell with the paint job. But there is more, you know, form breakup and stuff going on in here. It's just the paint job tends to uh, cover up all of it. So, you know, we can think of different ways to make sure that in when I paint on top of it or something, we can get something more interesting. Uh, now I'm wondering, uh, would it be interesting if we did like leather trimming on each of these um, and then like the little studs going down, I think could be kind of cool. So we could um, auto grip this. Or I'm gonna make sure that my brush is really big. Uh, and I wanna get more space for these so I can pull these down a bit more. And again, keeping it super low and super simple at first is going to help you with all this stuff um, in the beginning to make sure that it feels um, you know, 
and nice and coherent. And I can mask and grab this part and polish that up a bit more to see if I can get it feeling the mask these corners too. I'm asking the corners and then, because it's a little wobbly-ish, so I'm going to try to see if I can kind of smooth that out with a polish by features or just a polish. No, not just polish. I lied. Polish by features. Polish by features will help you. Um, yeah, we can get to do that kind of like that. Now, one thing that I want to make sure that I do actually on this piece I don't want this topology going all the way through. Um, because now if I try to insert like an edge loop or something, it's not it's not gonna be very friendly to me. Let's see. And if I do this, it's gonna create a ring, which is fine, but I don't really want to create a ring there. Um I'm also gonna go ahead, and because I feel like they're placed okay, I think it's gonna be easier to work with these separately. So I'm gonna do a group split and say okay. So now I can just work with this piece um, and not have to worry about the other pieces. Question from YouTube is uh, from New Beats is how do how do I approach hard surface modeling? So that's what we're covering right now. So don't go anywhere and you can find out. But also, um, you know, I think the biggest thing point to make with hard surfacing is it's gonna stay really low, at least for me personally, for a long time um, until I feel like everything feels uh, in the right proportion and in the right shape and in the right place. And then that's when you wanna start being able to add on top of um, that existing detail that you have. Um, so a lot of my stuff will also just not have, you know, thickness for a really long time until I feel like I'm sitting at a good spot with everything as a whole. Um, if you want to look at more uh, hard surfacing techniques, you can also, I think Josh Herman, who used to do Archetype on here, he has a things on YouTube, but he has a talk about him, you know, about how he blocks out Iron Man. And in the beginning, it's it's very much just um, flat shapes, all in the right places with all the right types of curvature, because then once, once it comes to adding thickness and like doubling stuff, um, it's actually, that's kind of the easiest part for making sure the topology looks good and making sure all that feels right first. Why is my brush being weird? Um, that's gonna help you a lot, you know? So it's, it's all about taking it kind of like one chunk at a time. So a lot of this stuff, again, I'm blocking out in simple colors with flat shapes, uh, inserting edge loops. It's being weird about the, I think ZBrush messed this up. Because it used to be consistent width and it used to be nicer. And now it's not anymore. Why you do this with easy brush? Yeah, it's, it's definitely one of those things that it, it can take some time or some patience um, at first, but I think it's really important to, you know, kind of see how all this stuff feels and see how the breakup feels first um, before going in and going crazy with detail. Because uh, if I start doing this stuff and I'm like, oh, you know, I actually don't like the way this looks, well, I didn't waste so much time, at least now, um, you know, making this. I'm just making a real quick simple thing and then moving on um you know and getting getting a feeling of how all that stuff is looking you know and then i can go in and place i can take that i should still have you know this guy oh my goodness that got really ginormous what do i do how do i make that so big
Oh my god, guys, help me. How did I turn that into something ginormous? I don't know what I did. That sucks. That's really obnoxious. No, it's all big. Somebody Google it for me. How do I how do I change this? This is terrible. Is it Control Shift Alt? Oh no, that's really obnoxious. Oh well, I'm gonna somebody Google it for me real quick. That'd be great. Or I'll Google it myself. Oh, um, because that's super annoying. I don't even know what I'd call that. Intermission menu size? That's hysterical. Why would, you, why would anybody want it that big? It's so ridiculous. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to call it. Oh well, I guess whenever I bring in the insert meshes, it's gonna be... The element with this way, that's gonna be fun. So if you want a constant size, by the way, for your uh, intermesh, you can just find a size that you like, and if you drag out and hold control, um, it'll snap to being that size. Um, which is super handy. So I can just hit control and tap and drag all these out. I hate how big this stupid thing is right now. It's driving me insane, but it's okay. Just take deep breaths, Ashley. It's hysterical. Alt drag up. Okay, hold on. I think I haven't. Somebody gave me an answer. Alt drag up. On what? How did I do that so magically and so effortlessly last time? Oh no, <laughs> I'm so sad. Yeah, I hate dividers in some brushes. You can't find them very well. Is it this divider? Oh wait, there it is. Oh my gosh, thank you. There you go. Okay, so alt and drag on these stupid little arrows. Good lord. Okay, I feel so much better. Thank you, games. James is our secret little guy in the back that helps me with things when I get super lost. Cool. We're back, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> it's fine. Oh, so annoying. I tried searching it on Google and it was like, you want to know how to make insert match for the same? I was like, no, I don't, I don't want that. Just tell me, tell me the answers, Google. There we go. I see, someone help me. Thank you, drag from center upward. See, you guys teach me things that I don't even know. I don't even know you could do. Well, I knew you could do some stuff like that, like these menus. You can hold all, um, and you, or control drag. Yeah, you can use control drag. You can be like scrolling menus, which is insane. So you can think about the number of buttons you can have on here. It's endless. Um, so it's little hidden weird features like that, but you no, know, it'll get you. It's impressive. I love how, you know, customizable and easy they make it for ZBrush, but sometimes when you don't know about it, it's a little confusing. You gotta be part of their secret club to know. Oh, I forgot to cut one. There we go. Yeah, so now we have like kind of like this weird leather trimming that will have studding on it, you know, trying to just keep it consistent with that theme. Um, we'll also go ahead and insert now that my insert matches back to normal. I do a lot of dragging out of stuff like this and then I'll go in and click like a normal cylinder so then I can adjust it. Um, so I can make adjustments on the fly really, really easily. I can turn this down to a lower level, maybe have it at like 12. 
if it lets me have it at 12. Usually you kind of want increments of eight um, or so. For some reason it seems to smooth out best when you know, it's like eight or 16 or increments of four as well. So some sort of exponential um, thing always helps. But yeah, I like to be able to, again, just insert mesh, drag out something, and then I'll go into the cog to make like a proper nice topology because it's just too high res. Again, I try to keep it super low to begin with. So I'm thinking this could be some sort of like pool portal. The back for our, I drew out a tube, not during the stream. I just drew one out. Um, I was blocking out stuff being like, yeah, I think it'd be cool if there was some sort of like weird tubing that goes down into this and, um, you know, it's getting its energies. Getting good, good, getting good vibes from stuff. And it's really easy also to block out things. Like for example, if we want, um, you know, I was picturing maybe there's like tubing or something like that. Like there's weird tubes that go along. Um, you can do a stroke. And then in um, curve functions, there'll be this frame mesh. Um, so we can say frame mesh border polygroups or crease edges. If we do border, it'll frame it like this. And then when we go into a brush, um, such as, I'll just use my tubes brush that I have. So I have a couple of tubes. Uh, if we drag it out, we go ahead and click it. It'll draw tubes along the borders. Um, and you can see it smooths it, but if we click it and hold control, uh, it, it'll try to snap it a little better to um, those edges. So now we can get something that has like nice tubing along it as well. Um, and then we can split that off. We can say split mass points. And now we have this whole tubing. And I can make sure that the color kind of matches with that. And I can adjust these studs and stuff later to kind of meld with it. Or I can, you know, push it down a bit if I need to. Maybe they do get, um, like, pinched in from the tubing. Oops. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's just thinking about like, how does this stuff function with one another? You know, do I want it to feel like it's getting pinched or later on I could also just delete it entirely. So I could also just, you know, select these parts that I don't want, um, auto group it, select that part and say delete hidden. And now I just have the top, right? And then I can kind of close them off with some sort of like cool piping or whatever it may be. But yeah, it fits right along nice and neat with uh, the top of the, and it is going to be a little weird, like if I smooth it, you can see that it gets a little kinky um, because it's trying to compensate for how low poly you've gone for polygonal this is. But you can run like a, a polish by features to kind of like smooth that stuff out if you wanted to. And then we can kind of fix the edges if we wanted them to be sharper or anything like that. So a lot of the stuff is adjustable once you just get it on, you know, the page, quote unquote, to speak. Um, will always be like really, really handy. So, cool. Now what I'll do, so if I want this to be like two separate, I think I want this to be like a couple separate pieces maybe. Um, it's pretty easy to do that. I mean, you can also, you can split it up into, it's easy enough to do something like this where I can, you know, I'll bevel this side and then I can bevel the back. Such as that, and I can just select it and delete it in, and I have two separate parts. Um, if I auto group it, you'll see I have two separate parts. So it's really easy to start splitting things off. And um, you know, maybe I want some piping that'll go along this way, so I can solo this out and I'll grab my tube brush again. I can drag that out. And I can make sure that I can say uh, bend start, bend in, lock, lock start, and lock in. And that'll help me kind of keep things in place. I can move the ends by grabbing the ends, but the other part won't move with it. So it's an easy way for me to kind of push this stuff down and adjust. I can always, I usually like to split anything that's kind of like tube-like for now. 
Um, that's funny. But again, that frame mesh feature is super handy. So for something like this, um, what I can also do is I'll keep my low res because I'm not sure what you know trim is going to be. But I can duplicate it for now. Um, I'll crease the edges. And I'm going to go ahead and duplicate it a couple times to lower. So now I have a frame, you know, a mesh that kind of looks like this. And if I want to create some cool tubes that kind of like run along this in weird ways, um, I can use my crease tool. So I'm going to go ahead and say crease and keep it to edges. And I'm just going to go ahead and crease a couple of these edges. I'm going to go across and then maybe, oops, be careful where you click, click down, you know, and then I'll have another one that maybe runs down this way. Maybe I'll just have this one cut across over here and back down. So if I have something that looks like that, I can now go to stroke back up to that frame mesh um, modifier. So if I go to the curve functions, instead of border, I can say crease edges. So I can do that. Um, oops, actually, uncrease edge loop. So I crease the uh, bottoms of these, so don't do that. So now I can say, that too. My mesh, and now I have that. And so now when I go back to my toothbrush right here, I can pick a size, I can draw it out and hold control. And it'll try to give me something. It'll always be kind of weird at the edges. Um, but I can do something kind of more organic. If you hold control perfectly, it'll be a little weird because it tries to snap the edge loops to, you know, where that is. But if I don't do it that way, say frame mesh and just click it. Now I can move it around and that gets pretty close. And then I can go ahead and say split mass points. And now I don't really need the mesh that's really heavy anymore. I can where you go? Find that one. I can use it for later if I want to, but for now I can also just delete it and get rid of it. Um, and now I have some tubing that goes along those edges. So um, a lot of the armor also has like cool, like kind of ribbed stacking. Um, I don't know what you call it ribbing, but here I'll have an example. So like these greaves, they have these like lines. So I think it would be cool if we kind of accentuated that. And then within those, we could add some more, you know, intense study or we could add like a leather strip around or something like that. So again, keeping to the aesthetic of, you know, what, uh, I don't know if this thing there has it, but something like this, yeah. Um, so I like cool, like welded lines with all this study because there's a lot of mobility that's happening. It's all these separate pieces that allow it to um, be super flexible, actually, which is really impressive. So like with these gloves, for example, um, I'll probably do something like this for his gloves. And I'm trying to figure out whether I actually want maybe a gauntlet like this or not. Um, but we can do something like this and have it feel, you know, add pipes and add cool detail to make it feel steampunky, but again, keeping within the aesthetic of, you know, medieval um, armor type button. So with this, you know, uh, I'm going to try to do something similar where I can extrude. All polygons. So I'm going to extrude them inwards. And then I can do an inset on the poly groups. So I can inset this, inset that again, and I can keep insetting it. If I wanted to. And then I could do an extrude on this edge loop. Q, I think I actually have to see a Q mesh on the edge loop. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, don't do funky things. Just do the right things. I want to do funky things. Why be so mean? Look at that. It's doing it all along, nice and perfectly, except for right here. <laughs> Why do you have to be like this? 
I like that I can do it really tiny. It's like, yeah, I got you. If it's super small, that's okay. We can just take it now and we can, um, we can just move the whole probably group probably. So if we extend this out, we can move it out. And then uh, I can just slide the opposite edge back in if I wanted to. Make me work for it, ZBrush. Don't like it. Let's see if it'll do it on this one. It doesn't, it's fine. It's very nice when it does do it, see? It, it does make cool stuff. I don't know why it's freaking out so much with this one. Maybe this is too close. I'll see if I can slide. If I slide this edge loop out a little bit, let's see what happens. I can mesh it again. I like to figure out the reasons as to why it does that. It's trying to snap really weirdly, um, which is super, super on. But again, since it's being weird, I'll just let it be weird. And we can just model this a different way. Because you can get the same effect by just insetting and extruding. It's just to me, if you can do it the other way, it's usually faster. Because um, then you don't have to go back and forth. You can just boop, 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 draw on all of them and then call it a day. So, you know, same effect. Annoying that sometimes it just doesn't want to cooperate. Make sure that these are all different color groups. So if you want to do that in the same group, I know almost again. And it should it should change the poly groups, it should be fine. And well, now if I increase that, you can start to see you'll get something interesting. I'll have to work more on where the creasing. It's because it always, it will always mess up on things where there's corners and then this, it doesn't read as obviously a normal change because it's not, but it'll try to smooth, you know, this outer side while this is staying tight. So you want to avoid stuff like that by just making sure that this outer um, polygon, you know, if I poly this right now, this corner, for example, increase it and then smooth it, you'll see that that issue goes away. So you just have to kind of do that to all those weird cases. Um, should be a little annoying, but nothing, nothing too crazy. Uh, Tauntaun is asking, do I teach stuff like this in Nomen? And is this basically free classes? Um, basically, if you ask the right questions, it can definitely be a free class type of thing. Um, I think I just like to, you know, try to get as much info for people as possible. Um, because not everybody can get to go to Nomen. You're not going to get, you know, out of the stream what you would get at Nomen. But I'm hoping to get, you guys get something out of it. That, that's always the goal. Um, because, you know, I, I want you guys to, what is this? I don't need this anymore. I don't think I need this anymore. Um, because yeah, if you guys have questions about stuff, I, I want to be a resource for you guys for that. Also, if any of you guys ask questions, I just have to talk. So, I'm probably just going to talk about whatever it is I'm doing, which means, yeah, you're going to be learning some stuff. So, yeah, free normal classes. But I won't go over, like, this is how you navigate if you've, like, never touched Zbrush before. But if you know what I'm doing, you can easily um, kind of start to figure out stuff. Yeah, since it says it's like having a personal mentor, it can, it definitely can be. If you ask questions, I will answer questions. I'm not talking to anybody. I'm just sitting in my room talking to myself, sculpting out um, steampunk acorns and stuff. So, yeah, definitely ask away. It's super important for you guys to want to learn. So, this is kind of blocked out enough, I think, to where I want it to be. Maybe I can insert in some ideas of like, I want a mech thing here, or something, something steampunky, you know, I gotta look at some of my more like steampunkish reference 
as to like what I wanted to begin with, but a lot of it's changed. Um, I think I have some meshes that are like gears and cogs and things. Um, I think it'd be cool to have like slits in this. Um, and then maybe it could like close from the inside or something like that. I don't know. I think that could be kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, you would basically put in to go in here. But you can boolean, you can do booleans right now if you wanted to, to try to get an idea of something. Um, they work okay on, you know, um, same side of issues. Someone on YouTube says the way I use Z-Modeler is amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, everyone calls me weird for using the Z-Modeler because everyone's like, actually, there are better modeling tools than ZBrush um, out there when it comes to hard service modeling. But I, I'm just lazy, honestly, if I'm being really honest with you guys. But I also just think I like how simple the tools are. I like staying within the same tool. Um, I just think it's a lot easier to stay within the same tool. So for me, if I can hard surface all this out, you know, in here, if I need to go into, you know, make some cool fills or something in another program, maybe I will. Um, but I think the biggest thing is that I, I like staying in the art process more than I like to be technical. So the more I can just, you know, negate that with being in one program, um, I'm going to. So yeah, I think, I think that stuff really helps a lot. I'm gonna add a, there needs to be some sort of like way that this hooks on. Right now it's just a big looped thing. So one thing to note is, you know, I haven't started like, you know, this is getting more textural detail and so the story is closed. But another way to make your model start feeling like it's really coming together is making sure that, you know, where it attaches, where things actually are supposed to have some sort of logic to it, um, actually work. So for example, I'll insert something here so I can make sense of this. Um, question on Twitch was, how was the learning curve for you with ZBrush? Did you learn from a course or school? Or did I teach myself using resources online? Uh, I went to Nomen. So I did do Nomen stuff. Um, I did some stuff this before going to Nomen. I dabbled in ZBrush, but um, at the time, there wasn't as many fleshed out tutorials and stuff. Um, there was a little bit, I mean, I won't lie, there definitely was some, but uh, yeah, for me, it was really more of actually just going to Nomen to, you know, properly learn all this stuff um, and get like a good idea of how this program works and whatnot, having awesome teachers. And now I also teach there, so I teach the intro to ZBush class, so I do what I you know, used to, which was teaching ZBrush. I'm wondering, I'm thinking out loud to you, is I think it'd be cool if this somehow, like, leather was attached to this, which then was attached to this, which then was attached to the belt. I think that would be kind of cool. Um, so I'm going to put some sort of placement like that. And again, I have those belt belt snappy brushes that I could I could probably use one of these. Let's see. What do I want? Maybe this one? The more you start adding some detail like this is where a lot of your stuff's gonna kinda come to life. Now um, if I was to make if I was doing like a a real game master or something. I wouldn't constantly be reusing these belts. I use them for the Joker character, so that's why I'm thinking I can reuse it now because they live within the same world. Um, so that totally works with, you know, what I'm trying to make. A uh, question from Twitch. Do you think an artist can make it without going to school? Just portfolio and experience. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't think you need, I mean, no one's probably not going to like me saying that. They're like, no, go to school. Um, <laughs> no, they, 
Um, but no, you can totally, you can learn all this stuff in your early art. I mean, most artists are self-taught. Most artists come from, you know, some sort of background that's really similar to that. Um, so it's not like it's shamed upon or something like that in the industry to not, you know. Um, me having a degree, which I actually don't, um, I have a certificate of completion because I didn't go to Melbourne um, when it was a uh, BFA program. So I don't have a degree, I just have good work. Um, and people from our industry know what Nomen is, so they know most of the time students come out of there pretty proficient in, you know, their field. Um, but, you know, I won't say that that's the end all be all. If you can learn the tool properly, then yeah, and you have good work. There's nothing stopping you from getting a job in this industry. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. Also being personal and like connecting. I mean, networking is the biggest reason, honestly. I can teach you ZBrush or you can t you can watch, you know, um, streams like this and you can learn a lot from ZBrush without ever going to an actual class. But I think the biggest thing that Nomen will give you is um, a form of community and networking that you won't get at a lot of other places. And you definitely just won't get it, you know, online. Um, it's just different. So I think that is more of the value of going to school is learning with other people and other artists is what's gonna make Nomen so powerful. Um, not just the, it's not just about the technical, you know, I know ZBrush now, but it's also just about, you know, growing your network with the next up and coming generation of artists, you know? Um, Cause if I really think about it, most of the time if I think about a big name studio, um, and this isn't like bragging, this is just true, is I probably know somebody from there that I've met in some way or shape or form kind of because of Nomen. Um, whether it's I've done talks for Nomen or they're just roommates of mine that I knew at Nomen, whatever it may be, um, chances are it's because of <laughs> because Nomen. Um, so yeah, I think that's the part that's more invaluable than Learning ZBrush. ZBrush is just a tool, you know, at the end of the day. It's a very cool tool, but it is just a tool. So, it's all about what you as an artist can bring to that tool, what you can do with it, you know. Um, Simon Lee, for example, is an amazing traditional sculptor, and he just started getting into, well, not just started getting into, but he started dabbling in, you know, um, ZBrush and now he does tons of work in ZBrush and it's one of those things where it's like yeah he didn't go to school for ZBrush he's just a really good sculptor so he's gonna do the best that he can with that tool because he's just a good artist so um that's also why on Archetype I try to talk about like character and story a lot of my stream ends up being talking kind of technical um just because I'm again doing technical stuff and sitting in a room by myself, talking to myself while I talk to you guys on stream. Um, so when there's not questions about things, I'll usually just explain what I'm doing, right? But I do try to make sure that I'm t talking to you guys. What are you doing? Why are you snapping all this stuff? Um, I'll make sure that I'm talking to you guys with like a purpose in mind of, you know, design or, you know, storytelling and stuff when we're creating these characters, um, shape language. I think all that stuff is really, really important um, for building believable and cool characters. And anyone can polish a turd in ZBrush, I promise you. I could teach, you know, someone who's never touched ZBrush how to kind of do stuff in it, but that doesn't mean they'll do good work um, just because you know the program. So I think it's really important to keep in mind that it's it's more about the artist behind that tool. Cool. So now I created something that makes kind of more sense, maybe. I mean, you can see already how just even adding details like that will start to flesh out your character more and more and more and more. So just be really patient. Um, 
with your tool and like with your building process because a lot of the stuff in the beginning i'm just like oh, i don't know what i'm gonna do with this uh you know and then over time you'll be like oh okay that actually <laughs> that's actually looking okay and that's that's working and that's you know that's where i want it to be um so yeah just keeping that stuff in mind but you know it all builds really gradually I'll probably do something similar where I'll add piping across the top of this, but then maybe down at the bottom. Um, it'll be like that riveting. So actually, see, as I talk out loud, I'm like, ooh, ideas, guys, ideas. So what I'll actually do is like, I can, um, I'll insert some much loop skater, and then I'll, I'm gonna split these all off. I can do something like that. So if I'm happy with the shape, I know I can do this pretty confidently, is I can, um, I'll say split, and I'll say group split, I'll say okay. And then as long as you have, when you say merge, as long as you don't have weld back on, I can merge these back down. I have one more. I can merge these back down, but if I smooth it, you can see they're all separate pieces. Um, and now what I can do is I can easily, you know, grab one and create some overlap. And push these back a little bit. I don't think my intention was actually to uh, split all of these up. I think my intention was to keep these together, um, but I can grab one and this one, and I could probably stitch them back together if I wanted to. Or since I have all that history of them, I should have all that history of them not being separate, right? Um, what I can do is I can duplicate this. So now this one doesn't have any history, but this one does, and I can go back to when they weren't split. Should be able to go back and join them when it's lit. We're not, it's fine. It's cool, don't worry about it. Just, just make do actually. If I didn't split them all, if I picked the correct one before merging down, I would have had all the history is my point, but I didn't do that. But yeah, you can keep in mind and stuff like that. You can be super aware of that, and if you're really aware of it, then obviously making changes and adjustments um, will be a lot easier. So, but it's easy enough to go in and I can rebridge these or do something else with these, which can be fun because I could probably use the filleting on this, or I could go in and stitch these if I wanted to. Which is, which is kind of annoying, I'm not gonna lie, but it'll be fine. As long as you put um, everything else to do nothing, it should be pretty easy to pick points. You can kind of like select edges or select faces that are near it and it should be, it should move a lot faster. Um, if you do have everything, all the components kind of like active, it'll be like, I don't know what you want from me. But if you turn them all off and say do nothing, then it's a lot easier to like select stuff. So. I can do the same with these guys. So I'm just selecting kind of close to them. You can see it's pretty easy to stitch these back together. I guess that wasn't so bad to show. But yeah, now I have something that, you know, if I auto group this again, it be very well. And now I have these. And what's cool about this is I can technically work on them all at once. So, like, I can make them all one polygroup. I can extrude all the polygons in. 
but then I can also inset polygroup all, and I'll get a perfect inset on all of them. Right, and then I can extrude these down. Whoops, polygroup all. Right, and then I can inset again. And I can say extrude polygroup all. Right, and now I have all three of them um, working at the same time. So that's also really handy to be able to do, is just be able to work on everything all at once. And then they all have the same beveling, they all have the same, um, you know, thicknesses and whatnot. Uh, um, so yeah, you can do something like that. I think what I want to make sure that I do though, make this much thicker first. Or I want to make sure that um, there's enough overlap between these. So if I auto group very well, I can select this one and I can pull this up a bit more. So I can snap this thing and pull this up to overlap even more. So that way I don't get that. Um, that I don't want the border entirely to be made up with that. So, you know, I, I'm trying to think of ways that I can kind of, you know, hide that or either, you know, have ways to work around it. So I can mask that. Yeah, you can see that I work really, I think the biggest key of the way I work most of the time is just working in really low qualities at first. Um, and then just building slowly onto that, I think is the most important thing. So now I'll extrude that. I'll hit Alt to make sure that they're all different poly groups. So that way I'm not extruding inward and inward and inward. And then I'll inset this. Yeah, see now I'm getting the lines that I want. Before I was getting, you know, the thing to go across here, which I didn't want. As long as they overlap it enough, you shouldn't be able to see it. And I can always make sure I can push these back later, so I can do something like that. You know, and maybe I only want one inset, so maybe if I want just one inset, I can just make it way bigger and thicker, because it's stylized stuff, so. Usually the secret to stylize stuff is just to exaggerate things by a lot more um, than reality would. Let's smooth out this little line here first before I do that. It's getting funky up in this corner, but that's okay. Unfunkify it first and then bring this in. So you can see everything's very, um, I try to be thoughtful about that process um, because later on if I'm thoughtful now it'll be easier for me to detail and do stuff later um, it'll make all the fun stuff a lot easier have fun with you know um, if you set up it's kind of like setting up the, a good base foundation or blocking in all your values properly first before trying to go in and paint something insane um, it's the same idea that, you know, if you can set all this stuff up first, nice and neat and clean, um, then yeah, life will be a lot easier for you later on down the road. I'm just creasing it so I can get that little pinch. You're always going to get this weird pinching until again you separate these two to uh, be different poly groups and then it'll work out this one. But yeah, now I just went like that. And now I'm wondering too is, you know, maybe the detailing on the inside can have like some cogs and wheels or something like that um, to, to keep with that hard surfacey vibe. So I'm just going to thicken up everything too that's around it to make sure that, you know, I'm following. All those good guides. I 
can also, you know, hide the pants if the pants are so technically again, you kind of want to usually move the thing that would move, if that makes sense. Like the armor plating is probably not gonna move before the cloth squishes in, right? So you probably wanna move in that stuff before moving the hard surface stuff. And then, you know, I'll eventually you can do sculpting around it to be like, oh, this is, you know, pinching or, um, you know, it's hitting or squeezing a, pot, a spot or whatever it may be. Um, and if you go from there, you continue working on it. And I keep doing the detailing to Again, it's really just more about blocking in the details that I want to see. Um, and maybe this time, Humesh will be nice to me and I can just insert. We'll see though. <laughs> I'm gonna try. Okay, being somewhat nice. Yay, there we go. See how much easier that is when it wants to do it? It's so nice. I like being able to do that. What I like about it is it also keeps nice thickness around. Yeah, it's just way easier. But with some stuff, it just wants to be thick here. and maybe what kind of shapes can be in you know, the gauntlet area. They may be like a little, you know, hole with some glass in it or something like that. And then eventually there'll probably be some tubing or something. Um, this inside, I'm thinking maybe we could have the same material as, you know, the quilted padded texture, but the whole arm. Um, so maybe we could do something like that. Let's see what that looks like. You know, again, this is really easy to, maybe we can, you know, Then go to our movie master. I always say work on clone because sometimes if you don't, if you just work on it in the scene and you unwrap it and do some weird automation, it has an ability for some reason to change scale on you. It's really obnoxious, um, but it does. Cool. And that should work for our um, that we have and button copy. So yeah, if you don't work on clone, bring it back in and then paste it. Um, it can change scale on you, which at first you may be like, that doesn't sound so bad actually, but um, it can be bad because if you're working on the cat making or something like that, your scale gets all messed up and then your keys are off and all sorts of giddy things happen to you. So then you have to correct it later, fix it somehow. Um, so yeah. I'm gonna say edit and I can copy this so I can take all the settings and I can say no one's face. Bring it and boom, there it is. Boom, there it is. Uh, question from Twitch is how long did it take you to get comfortable enough with ZBrush to get uh, to do hired work? Um, well I went to school, so you know, obviously that helps, is going to school helps and getting all that stuff. Um before getting, you know, into the industry. But then on top of that, um, after Noman, I got an internship um, with Legacy Effects. And so that also, you know, helped was I was able to get an internship and kind of put, you know, the skills that I had to the test and see if, you know, I can kind of like do the job. And a lot of it too is, you know, knowing the tools one thing, but then doing the job is going to be always something completely separate anyway. Um, so you're always, no matter how experienced you are, you're always going to be learning on the job. You just are. Um, and so I think it's important to keep that in mind too. And studios know that as well. I mean, even when I started, you know, at a new studio recently or whatever it is, um, they understand there's going to be a bit of a learning curve 
to you know their workflow, their pipeline, and things like that um, to begin with. And so it's okay to like feel like you know maybe you feel unprepared for the job, and that's okay because most times I think everybody feels unprepared usually. Can I go back to a state where this wasn't? No, I'll have to open up my other phone. I wanted to actually get rid of this and put it on a separate thing because then I was thinking I could just add like a weld. Anything that can be separate, I like to make separate, but maybe that now it's again, I'll just leave it there. Circles are annoying. Circles are annoying to keep into um, matches because like if I try to mess with the shape of this armor at all, it immediately will mess with that circle. So it's just one of those things, it's kind of annoying. I'm gonna go ahead and say increase all, or um, yeah, increase all. And then I'm gonna go and crease these edges that I want um, tubes to be at. So I'll crease edge. I don't want there to be tubing on top of this. Something like that. And then I can go back to my stroke. I can say crease edges. And then I can go to tube. Draw size. Oops. I did crease that edge, didn't I? Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I don't know why it's not doing it. That is weird. Oh well, I'll fix it later. Uh, I think there's going to be a question from Synth on Twitch. Speaking of scale, when importing different meshes with different scaling, what's your process to import them correctly so they all match? Especially those times when brush takes a long time to adjust the size to the scale um, of the imported mesh. So, scale can be a weird thing. So it kind of depends on like what kind of scale you're talking about, I guess. Um, if you're working within, you know, one character, all this should be, you know, one scale, and it's easy enough to take um, this as a whole and scale it differently. Um, but if you accidentally, you know, for example, you're bringing in something into Maya and then you're scaling it wrong or something like that, then yeah, that's going to be a little harder to fix or to adjust. Um, what I usually do that on is. Um, if you have an idea of what your scale is going to be, you know, so if you're working in Unreal Engine or, you know, you're printing miniatures or whatever it is, just bring in the actual, you know, bring in a box or a cube from Maya or something that has accurate measurements and, um, you know, always bring that in as like a point of reference so that way you know whether or not, um, uh, why do you do this? I like that you add this feature. Brush, but sometimes it can just be a little weird. So yeah, I always have, you know, for example, when I was making sideshow collectibles, we would always have like a one-inch cube or something like that um, to reference to make sure that, you know, our reference was, our model was um, the right scale and things like that. But other than that, it's going to be like just adjusting things. Um, it's important to model certain things at scale and not change them later. So, for example, if you're making, you know, it's really only practical in, um, when you're 3D printing stuff. So if you have a maquette that you sculpted and you added keys to it, and then, you know, when you add keys to something, you need to make sure that there's room for the key on the other side. So you always need to boolean out more than you think. But the issue is if you don't do that at something where, I don't know, this chipmunk, for example, has a key and anybody's right now at the scale of, you know, four feet tall or something, for example. Uh, well, that boolean inside the key, if you make it like a two inch, you know, um, clearance measurement or something like that, 
Well, if you scale it down, that two inch clearance all of a sudden becomes, you know, super, super tiny and so tiny if you make it too small that like you won't be able to fit your pieces together. So some stuff has to be modeled at the scale that's going to be printed at, but that's that's for 3D printing very specifically. That's not really the case for a whole lot of other things. Um, a case that it might be important for is, you know, for physics and dynamic stuff. So if you're bringing in a character into Marvelous Designer, for example, um, your character needs to be the correct scale for Marvelous um, to simulate cloth correctly. Because um, if, you know, you want to think about it, the way a giant, you know, I don't know, flag or big banner would like fall in wave is very different from like you dropping a Kleenex, right? Or like a, a tissue cloth or something like that, or a rag. Um, they act really, really differently, even if they're made of the same material, just due to like sheer size and weight. Um, and so with stuff like that, you want to make sure that you're rendering and simulating in the correct scale or else you're going to get something that looks really weird and it's going to look inaccurate. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my long-winded answer for scale. Long-winded answers, that's what I'm here for. A uh, question from YouTube is, can you set your character in a realistic environment in ZBrush? Uh, I guess now you can because in, you know, if you, what, last week? They just released um, 2023 and it has um, redshift capabilities, which is really cool. So redshift is a ray tracing like renderer renderer. I would never personally build out a scene in ZBrush. And the reason is, as I can show you right now, is if I was in a Maya scene or a scene with, you know, accurate, um, a real camera or like an accurate camera, I could go between, you know, the chipmunk's legs or go through his arm and fly through his arm, but that doesn't happen in ZBrush. This is just a fake zoom. Like, I can zoom in as far as I can and as hard as I can, but you can see I'm never going to go past the model. I'll never go through his arm. Um, and that's because it's not really a real camera that you're looking at your model in. Um, it's like this weird two and a half B cheat. Um, and so because of that, Setting up a realistic scene isn't actually very realistic because you can't control the camera the way you should in real life. Um, so being able to create like a dynamic or like a, a very um, what's a cinematic look to your scene is going to be really difficult just because you're going to be fighting with how ZBrush just works, um, unfortunately. So. Yeah, that's where I would bring it into Blender, or bring it into Unreal 5, or bring it into, you know, now they have Redshift, so we'll see. I don't really know how that works with their cameras, um, because again, their cameras are not real accurate. Um, but yeah, so we seem to have gotten at a pretty decent spot. Um, but you can see as I started detailing some of the stuff and adding color to the top, um, the more you kind of just stack on top, the more and more this character will start to kind of come to life with its steampunky build. Um, but we are coming up on time. It's coming up on six o'clock. And um, yeah, I'll have to catch you guys on the next one. Join me, as always, uh, with me, probably Tauntaun and Sin, as we are the three that always seem to be here. Um, <laughs> And you can join me and we can finish up wrapping up this arm. I'll probably do a little, try to do a lot off stream because we need to pose and kind of finalize and stuff next week. And maybe put our two characters together and call it a day and then move on to whatever our next archetype will be. So that'll be super exciting. So yeah, join me next stream for that. And uh, I will catch you guys later and next time. Bye everyone.